Okay, so we're out here with our massively overspined arrows. And then keep in mind too, we're shooting these without any points whatsoever. That is important in the context of primitive archery. Hey guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive, where we entertain, educate, and inspire. And on this channel, we do a lot of primitive builds, how-tos, and hunting videos just like this one. So if it is your first time to my channel, do please consider subscribing because we're working hard to get you where you want to be in your own primitive building and hunting adventures. And today we are talking about building and hunting with massively overspined cane arrows, especially with ones with no points or practice practice with practicing with them with no points on them whatsoever and why this is very significant in the linear evolution and context of primitive archery. So what I've got here is a set of three cane arrows that are what we would consider massively overspined. So these arrows are all over 85 spine weight. Uh, so why this is important is I can shoot these arrows without any points on them whatsoever. And I can shoot them very cleanly, very accurately off of my primitive bow. And I really can't emphasize enough the significance of this in regards to linear evolution of the bow and arrow. So when we think about modern archery today, we use of uh, slow motion cameras, learned and applied mechanics, we know that the archer's paradox or the paradoxing of the arrow is designed when you're shooting the arrow from the bow that as the arrow starts to move forward it bends around the riser of the bow and we know this to be the case because we obviously have film footage of this and this has been a known fact for a very long time but before long before any of that there was a much much simpler solution so there certainly was a basic understanding of paradox in a shaft even before the bow and arrow. So let's talk about the atlatl for just one moment and the throwing spear because it is easy to figure out once you are an accomplished spear thrower that you need the proper amount of flex. Now that is not nearly as picky as say a modern day arrow, but one that is too stiff, doesn't have the, the proper flight characteristics, and it's a, it's a little more sensitive to say a bad throw, where if you have one that bends way too much, the spear flops and bangs around. So you find that happy medi medium ground where it straightens itself out very quickly, but it will bend and move to straighten itself out in flight that makes it a more forgiving arrow but also a very accurate and straight flying arrow or dart or spear. And we're talking about the same thing in regards to the arrows. But the thing that we must remember about an arrow, the more that it flexes in flight, the more that it is losing energy, especially if it's flexed when it hits the target. So our real main goal is to get an arrow shaft that will rebound off of the paradox really quickly and focus all of its energy forward instead of dispersing or deflecting energy away from the center point of the arrow going in. So I have both arrows made of river cane and hardwood. And so this is, applies to both of these. What makes river cane a superior arrow material, meaning when you have it, you certainly use it. Not every place had it, but many did, is river cane being that it's hollow and it retains its shape very well, recovers from any paradox very, very quickly. Where hardwood tends to have a little bit more flex to it and it's a little slower to rebound. And that's what makes hardwood arrows a little bit more finicky to shoot. Anybody that's shot a lot of hardwood arrows will notice that they do a fair amount of wiggling until they eventually straighten out. Where river cane tends to come off the bow very, very quick, maybe a slight adjustment, and then they straighten right back out. And that's going to make for a really uh, good penetrating arrow. So rounding back to why this is so significant in the context of primitive archery is, although early people certainly understood that a certain amount of flex was good, being able to calculate that flex to the level that we do today was truly, I wouldn't say impossible, but incredibly impractical, especially when there's a much easier way. So there's obviously been arguments before that uh, early peoples would be able to make their own primitive spine testers, and 
kind of yes and no. I've made primitive spine testers and they're not nearly as accurate as ones we have today and therefore the dynamics in that spine that you're measuring are not going to be as accurate either and it's really all for nothing when there's a very very simple solution. That solution comes within the building of the bow and I've talked about this before that when you're building a bow the string will want to favor a side of the bow. If we're talking about an all-natural wood bow when you make it very rarely does it track perfectly right up the center. Naturally it wants to favor one side or the other. Anybody that builds primitive bows will know exactly what we're talking about here. And so it's easy to figure out that if we put the arrow on the side of the bow that the string favors, that inherently makes it closer to a center shot and the arrow requires less paradoxing to go around, in some cases no paradoxing at all, to go around the handle of the bow. This would have been really easy to figure out in primitive times as well because when you make a homogeneous bow that looks the same top and bottom limb, you might pick it up and shoot it this way, you might pick it up and shoot it this way, and I do the same thing with arrows as well where I might, because there's two ways to knock an arrow with the with the, with the knock that's cut in, it goes this way, or you flip it 180 degrees and it goes this way. Sometimes an arrow flies better this way, and if it doesn't, I can flip it over and it'll fly better this way. Well, it's going to be the same thing with a bow. So it wouldn't have taken primitive man long at all to realize that if he is holding a bow straight and the string favors this side, that the arrow sticks out very, very far off to this side, and that makes for a lot of contact on the handle. Where if we flip the bow over and place the arrow on the side, you can see how much straighter now it is. So as they take a bow and they shoot it one way, say, well, it doesn't shoot very good, or, you know, all these arrows are really picky coming off the bow this way, it's not going to take long for them to start examining the bow and say, well, why does it fly better off that side than this side? And as you sit and study it, you realize that the string favors one side and that's the side that shoots better and so that becomes part of your tradition in primitive bow building and it decreases significantly the amount of paradox needed in the shaft and then that's why we can shoot extremely heavy spines and almost any spine arrows off of these bows. And another reason that this is so significant in the context of primitive archery is by using a stiffer or a heavier spine, meaning it takes less deflection, that shaft is thicker walled, which that's what keeps it from bending quite as easily. And inherently now the shaft is heavier. And we do know this through kinetic energy tests and say the uh, Dr. Ashby reports that heavier arrows do penetrate better. And that is a very, very well known fact. So by shooting a heavier spine arrow, inherently the shaft itself is heavier. So when you shoot an arrow that is a much lighter spine and it's a lighter arrow, especially in a river cane arrow, it can be very difficult to get those heavier weights for proper penetration. It can be done. We've done quite a few short light spined arrows that only weigh 350 or so grains and we still get plenty of penetration and kill. But as we start working through this organically, we start resorting back to ways to increase the arrow weight. And one of those ways is to simply just shoot a thicker, heavier arrow shaft. And primitive peoples would have figured this out rather quickly. And this really illustrates how important it is for organic learning. To, rather than simply consuming and regurgitating previously written information in theory, but rather putting your hands on the equipment, going out shooting it, hunting with it, seeing what works, what doesn't work, how can we make it better while still keeping in the primitive context, is going to give you a lot clearer picture as to the true context of early man hunting with the bow and arrow. So in my own journey of organic learning, when I first began building primitive bows and arrows, there was very little information in regards to uh, any sort of context or how to actually make it work. And so when we talk about, I wanted to build bows and arrows 
without the modern equipment that we have and use today. And I knew that early peoples were able to do it, so I wanted to be able to do the same thing. And it didn't take long for that organic approach to work itself out, which again is super important when we're talking about linear evolution of the bow and arrow. So my earliest, all of my earliest kills were with arrows that were not spine tested at all. In fact, most of them were massively overspined, like massively overspined. And I was still building bows and the arrows were shooting really well, but I would make a set of arrows and I would go shoot them and I would pick the ones that shot really well. And then as my bow building got better and I started to figure out that if the string tracks on the one side, that it's going to shoot more arrows better. So I had some bows that shot really well and some bows that seemed really picky. And that's the, again, the natural progression of learning how to do this until it becomes intuitive. Now, pretty much every bow that I make, uh, I can shoot almost any arrow off of it because I know what I'm looking for in the build. But in those early builds, after I would make a handful of arrows and pick out the ones that I wanted, uh, I had a set of arrows that would shoot very straight, very well, and I was killing animals without any of the help of modern tools to measure uh, deflection and weight and those sort of things. And we were very, very successful doing it. And it wasn't until I started applying modern technology to recording data and measuring spine and weight that I start to figure out that most of my arrows that I was hunting with at the time were anywhere from 80 up to 120 pound spine. Massive, massive arrows, but they also had a lot of weight. They carried a lot of momentum and kinetic energy and we killed a lot of animals with them. And that, that is a true piece of organic uh, evolution in primitive archery in itself using me as that analog. The fact that I wasn't trying to build something that somebody else did, I just took materials, built it, made it work. And when it did work, then we looked at the materials and said, what are these and why do they work when so many people today would say that they wouldn't? Okay, so we're out here with our massively overspined arrows. And then keep in mind too, we're shooting these without any points whatsoever. That is important in the context of primitive archery a lot of people always say or ask how do we practice with stone points without them getting dull we want to make sure our arrows fly good that's another really important piece to this whole project that we can shoot arrows with no points on them whatsoever and then we affix very small little arrowheads that do not change the flight of the arrow and we've also shown that we can take and actually hunt small game. We can hunt rabbits and squirrels with arrows with no points on them whatsoever, preserving our stone points for big game hunting. So let's take these heavy spined arrows that uh, are deemed pretty much impossible to shoot straight and accurate by modern archery standards because they are so heavy spined and have no points on them whatsoever. Let's see how they shoot. All right, we got a wonderful group right there. And now some people would say, well, at these shorter distances, uh, of course it's gonna be easier. Wouldn't it be more difficult further back? And we'll do some shots back there as well. But keep in mind that our closer distances, that's when we're gonna see the majority of the yaw or even the uh, dynamic paradox of the arrow before it straightens out. So our closer distances is where we really need that arrow to fly straight. The longer distance we have, the longer time we have for the arrow to straighten out and begin to fly perfectly straight. So your close distances is where you're gonna really see uh, incorrect arrow flight. But we got it figured out that it's an absolutely perfect group at about eight or so yards. Pretty nice group overall. All right, now stepping back a little bit further just to show that we get great flight characteristics out at this distance. And although in modern times, I typically don't shoot very far in, in my modern hunting situations because animals move, in prehistoric times, there were instances to shoot much further, especially uh, out west when you, when you have greater distances uh, to shoot. And then also something on uh, like elk and moose and bison that have larger kill zones. And that's another reason that it's really important to have very heavy arrows to get that penetration needed.
beautiful arrow flight even out to 20 yards and it's only going to get better better the further back you go all right folks thanks for following along and hopefully we got you one step closer to getting you where you want to be in your own primitive archery and hunting adventures and we'll catch you on our next adventure